Okay, so I'd like to call the meeting to order of the Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> this meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department Board of Commissioners is being recorded via Zoom for distribution to the community television stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items of the official agenda as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. Uh, Mr. Pacino will be the board secretary uh, this evening. And uh, what I'd like to do, as I had mentioned, we're going to be moving the public comment section to just after the report of the uh, audit committee. If we could move into the report of the audit committee, please. Sure, is uh, the floor mine? Okay. So, yes. go ahead, I'm sorry. oh, go ahead, please, go ahead. Okay, my name is Zach Fentross, and I am an audit manager at Melanson, and we were the audit firm who performed the December 31st, 2019 audit of the Reading Municipal Light Department. And tonight I'm going to go through the financial statements and highlight some certain uh, account balances and some trends. So if at any point anybody has any questions, please feel free to stop me, and I can go over those at that time. Uh, before I jump into the financial statements, I just want to... Um, make a note that the financial statements are not presented on a comparative basis since the prior audit was for a six month period. This was due to the department moving its fiscal year end from June 30 to December 31st. And that took place in the prior calendar year. There was a fiscal year audit for the June 30, 2018 period. And then there was also a six month audit as of December 31st, 2018. So the information that would be presented on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in that's position would not be comparable if uh, both were presented. So the department uh, management decided not to present comparative for the December 31st, 2019 on it, but the department management does expect to pre begin presenting comparative financial statements again, starting with the December 31st, 2020 audit. So before I, I jump in, I think it's important to have a conclusion or a takeaway from uh, my presentation. I think that the things that um, the individuals here should be taking away is that the department had positive operating results in calendar year 2019, a well-funded OPEB trust fund, and no management letter. And I can get into what no management letter uh, means maybe a little bit later in my presentation. If I could first have you turn to the first page after the table of contents. This is the first page of the independent auditor's report. Uh, the department received a clean opinion, which means that there are no exceptions, which is the best opinion you can receive from an independent audit. And this is the same opinion that the department has received in prior years. If I next have you turn to page three, which is the first page of the management's discussion and analysis. And the management's discussion and analysis takes place on pages three through six. And this uh, is excuse me, uh, did, um, did you want to present that page uh, as we're seeing it here, or uh, how do you want to do this? I'm sorry, I don't follow. Oh, can you, no, we don't see the, we don't see the page being presented. Do you have it handy? I'm sorry. Can you, or does it need to be presented, I guess is the question. I can't pull it up as like a presentation, like on the screen, okay. my apologies. Tracy has it. Wendy, is that something you can do? I think Tracy's doing it right now. Is that correct, Tracy? Tracy's working on it. Thank you. You want me to pause and hold until she gets that up? Yes, please. Just, just for a minute, sure. Sure, no problem. While we're doing that, um, there was, I, uh, I forgot to ask that all remote participants uh, please identify themselves if we wouldn't mind maybe everyone just saying hello and who you are. Sure, I'll get the ball rolling. I'm, I'm Zach Fentross. I'm the, the audit manager in charge of the December 31st, uh, 2019 audit of the Reading Municipal Light Department. We're Tom and Ann Model on 93 Oak Street in Reading. 
Jim Satterthwaite from 8 Hunt Street in Reading. Thank you. David Kay on Pratt Street, member of the UUCR. Bill Page, Chair of the Green Sanctuary, New Church of Reading, and Coordinator of the Greater Reading Alliance for Clean Energy. Or Grace. Jeffrey Quorum from 31 Ridge Road. Carolyn Whiting from 17 Chestnut Road in Reading. Martha Moore, 102 Sanborn Lane, and a member of the Conservation Commission. And Bruce McKenzie, same address. David Zeke, 163 Pearl Street in Reading, and the Climate Advisory Committee in Reading. Thank you, everyone. Mr. Steppenman, am I good to uh, continue? Yes, you are. Yeah, we've got it presented. We've got it up now. So what page are you referring to? Page three? This is, page three. This is the first page of the independent auditors report. Uh, and this, Tracy, I'll be, I'll be brief. This is, a, again, the department received the clean opinion, which means there are no exceptions, which is the best opinion you can receive from an independent auditor. Uh, and again, this is the same um, opinion that the department has received in prior audits. Tracy, if you could go down to page five. Thank you. And this is the first page of the management's discussion and analysis. And this takes place over the course of the next four pages. And it's just a narrative summary of the results of operation. Uh, and this section also discusses any major financial areas. So instead of just simply sitting here and reading this to you, I'd actually like to jump to page seven or page nine for you, Tracy. Uh, and that's going to be the statement of net position. And we'll discuss the same topics there that are discussed here uh, in the management's discussion and analysis. The first item I'd like to bring to your attention is maybe about a third of the way down the page. It's under non-current assets. It is the capital assets net of accumulated depreciation. That has a balance of 79,084,000, which is actually about a 1.8 or $1.9 million increase from the prior year. Now this increase is primarily due to improvements in infrastructure. In, in total, the department uh, spent 6.5 million in total capital asset additions but that was softened by about 4.5 million in depreciation expense, which leads to about the $1.9 million increase in that account balance. Now, some of the major capital asset additions that took place in calendar year 2019 was 1.1 million was spent on new poles and fixtures, 2 million was spent on overhead conductors, and 1.3 million was spent on underground conduit and devices. The next item I'd like to bring to your attention is maybe two thirds of the way down the page. Keep scrolling, Tracy, and there you go. It's under liabilities and it's non-current liabilities. And the first one there is the net pension liability. And the net pension liability has a balance of 14610000 Now this balance represents the department's portion of the total unfunded liability for the Reading Contributory Retirement System. And the Reading Municipal Light Department's portion of that total unfunded liability is 28%. And the system as a total is at 72% funded. And what we see in the Commonwealth as an average is, is, is around 65 to 70%. So that system is slightly above average when compared to other communities in the Commonwealth with uh, funding that total liability. Now, this is actually a $3.8 million increase from the prior year, that $14.6 million figure. It's about an increase of 3.8 from the prior year. And that increase is primarily due to the retirement system's investment results coming in less than what was anticipated. And it came in less than what was anticipated by about $13.4 million. So if you take the $13.4 million, multiply it by the 28%, you get to about $3.8 million. So that's really the primary driving factor for that increase in that liability is that investment results came in uh, less than what was anticipated uh, for the retirement system. The next figure I'd like to bring to your attention is actually the one right below that. It is the net OPEB liability, and that has a balance of $7,094,000. This is actually a decrease of about $280,000 compared to the prior year, so it was very comparable uh, to uh, the 2018 figure. And essentially, this is just the department's health insurance. Uh, and the department actually has set aside funds to begin funding that liability and has funded that liability of about at about 36 or 37%. Now, this is actually a strong financial position for the light department. 
because most communities, uh, specifically towns in the Commonwealth, have funded this liability anywhere from 1% to 10%. And then when compared to other light departments in the Commonwealth, other light departments are, are, are funding that liability anywhere from 20 to 40%. So the department, so the Reading Municipal Light Department, to have that funded at 36% is on the higher end of your contemporaries, which again is a strong financial position for the Reading Municipal Light Department. If I could have you turn the page to page 10, Thank you. Uh, there's a couple figures I'd like to bring to your attention here. The first one is maybe about halfway down the page. It's under, it's the first item under operating expenses. That's good, Tracy. Can you actually go up just a bit, Tracy? Perfect, right there is great. Is purchase power expenses. That's a balance of 61,027,000 for calendar year 2018. When extrapolating out the prior year, uh, this is actually about a decrease of about $9 million compared to the prior year. So the cost of power that the department had to, uh, the department expended to purchase power was actually less than it was in the prior year. And that can be seen as an offset to the, re the operating revenues. So if you look under operating revenues, the very first line item is electric sales net of discounts. And that has a balance of about $89,475,000. Again, when extrapolating out the prior year, that figure is about $9 million less than, than the prior calendar year. So essentially the department had savings on the cost of the power that I purchased and then it passed those savings on to the customers because that they saw that they, the department received were again passed on uh, to the customers of the light department. And then Tracy, if you go down to the bottom, the last number I'd like to bring to your attention here tonight is three numbers from the bottom and it is the change in net position. And that has a balance of 4319000 This is essentially the net income for the Reading Municipal Light Department. And again, this shows a, a strong position uh, that the, the department had strong operating results in calendar year 2019. This is the last thing I wanted to bring to your attention. So again, I think in conclusion, the takeaway should be that the department had positive operating results in calendar year 2019 a well-funded other post-employment benefits trust fund, and no management letter. And a management letter is essentially uh, above and beyond looking at and verifying the numbers in the department's financial statements. Uh, we also look at the internal controls to make sure that the department's assets are appropriately safeguarded. And if we had any recommendations to improve those internal controls, we'd recommend them in a formal management letter. And the department did not receive a management letter, which is indicative of the department's management taking the internal controls and the uh, safeguarding of the assets very seriously uh, and they ensure that those controls are operating effectively at all times. Uh, of Melanson's clients, uh, approximately 10% do not receive a management letter. So the department not having a management letter puts them in very high um, you know, esteem in, 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 uh, with their contemporaries and not having a management letter, which is, again is a very indicative and, and positive of uh, management at the light department. Thank you very much, Zach. I think we're ready to move on then to the report of the Audit Committee. Uh, Mr. Pacino? Yeah, so uh, the Audit Committee met, I believe it was last Thursday, uh, and basically Zach reviewed uh, a lot of the information that he's just reviewed, except in more detail. Uh, there were some questions that uh, were raised. Uh, Zach has written a memo in answering those questions. Uh, there were some changes requested uh, in the report, particularly uh, there was a uh, the question on the COVID-19 that was added to the report that uh, the COVID-19 has not affected the department either operationally or the supply chains in terms of that. So that's the one thing that's been added, but some other changes that uh, have been identified and been, have been changed. The committee did uh, recommend the uh, report be accepted, the financial statements be accepted by the, by the commission. That was a unanimous vote, with the, but there was the provision that the, uh, the items be addressed, which they have been addressed, and there is a memo out there on, uh, on those items. So um, with that, um, I can make a motion, Mr. Chair, if you're, if you're ready at some point. Please, yes. Okay, let me find it. <laughs> Uh, move that the Board of Commissioners accept the audit report from Melanson. Calendar year ended December 31st, 2019, as presented and as amended by the Audit Committee on the recommendation of the General Manager. Do I have a second, please? Second. Hold a second. 
Any discussion? If not, could I uh, take a vote, please, to accept the motion? Mr. Pacino, aye. Mr. Stenesi, aye. Mr. Talbot, aye. Mr. Hennessy, aye. Mr. Coulter, aye. Thank you. Please record 5 0 acceptance. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, uh, so we're uh, moving on to the next item, which is the uh, public comment. You want uh, Zach like to start. Stay? Zach oh, I'm sorry. You want. I'm sorry, Phil? Zach can head off if you want. But I'm, uh, if it were your Lucas, Lucas is uh, like. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Would it be okay if I make a quick statement? Yes, please. Go right ahead. I'd, I'd really like to thank the, the staff uh, at the Reading Municipal Light Department, uh, specifically Wendy, Colleen, uh, Stephen, Patty, and Trevor, who we worked very closely with on the audit. Um, there were certainly some uh, difficulties encountered into the COVID-19, and the staff at the department worked exceptionally hard uh, to make this audit as smooth as possible. So I just wanted to thank them for all their hard work in, in, in helping uh, get this product done. So again, thank you to everybody involved. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. I'd like to, I'd like to also... Um, Commend Melanson for you know making this happen virtually. It wasn't an ideal situation, but uh, they were able to pull it off with us. And um, I believe we were one of the first audits to get done this year. So uh, you know, kudos to his team, and uh, they did a great job. So thank you, Zach. Okay, I'd like to move on uh, to the public comment. We'll start with the RMLD Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, Jason, do you have any uh, any feedback or comments? Uh, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, the uh, liaisons to the RMLD board, uh, Karen or Vanessa, I, I'm i sorry, I don't see them here. Perhaps they're not here. Okay, they may not be here this evening. Uh, now we're into public comment. Uh, if any of the members of the public with us here tonight, by the way, we're very excited to see so many people interested in, in uh, helping us get through this and watching our paint dry. Um, but it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you all here. And if you'd like to make a, a comment, please uh, just give us your name uh, and uh, obviously your address. And then uh, please limit your comment to, uh, to five minutes, please. Would anyone care to make a comment before we move on? I would, Jeffrey Quorum. Yes, go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jeffrey Corum of 31 Ridge Road in Reading. I'm a town meeting member as well as an employee of Analog Devices, a large customer of RMLD. But I want to be clear that I'm here speaking just as a town resident. I had some slides to convey my points, which I sent to Tracy Schultz this morning, but she said I cannot show them because they were not sent 48 hours in advance, even though I'm just asking to share them from my computer on Zoom during this public comment session. Anyway, if you want them, she has them. Uh, what you would have seen on the slides, and you can sort of see in the Zoom background, is my daughter's artwork from the RMLD Shred the Peak Art Contest a couple of years ago. Which, by the way, is fantastic. She did a fabulous job. Thank you, Thank Jeff. You. Yeah, she won a prize. So I take notice of the Shred the Peak messages, and I was shocked to see the suggestions on Twitter to raise the temperature on your AC from 70 to 73. My slides would have shown three different images from the RMLD Twitter feed, and then a screen capture from the RMLD webpage suggesting 68 to 72 degrees. 68 degrees? The people in my tell house tell me 68 degrees is freezing in winter, so it's crazy to say that 68 or 70 degrees is the normal non-peak air conditioning temperature for the summer. Energy Star says we should set our thermostats to 78 degrees when we're home. That's six degrees warmer than the Shred the Peak conservation recommendation. Those of us who are already at 78 degrees think we're already exceeding RMLD's recommendations, so we're not going to make changes during Shred the Peak. My screenshots would also have shown uh, screenshots from Energy Star, Consumer Reports, and even two air conditioning manufacturers, all showing 78 as the recommended temperature. I emailed Joyce Mulvaney at the end of June, and she did make a change. She removed the temperature suggestions, so the Twitter graphic just says, raise the temperature a few degrees. However, the RMLD website still has a video that says 70 to 74 degrees. And the uh, Daily Times Chronicle from this Monday, if you read down here, it says 70 to 73 degrees. So I would like to ask the board to direct RMLD to change all the Shred the Peak messaging to use the Energy Star recommendation of 78 degrees for normal and suggest customers raise it to 80 degrees during peak times. Thank you. 
I think Jeffrey's got some uh, excellent points. Um, and I don't know how we settled on the our degrees temperature in the first place, but um, uh, I personally agree with you, Jeffrey. I think it's uh, turning it up higher is exactly the right thing to do and or making that suggestion anyway to people to be able to do that. Um, are there any other comments uh, from the commissioners? Uh, yeah, it, it does seem common sense. Um, and I'm also, I haven't seen these, uh, is the, did the slides get sent around to the full board at some no, point? We just, we just got them and we, and Jeffrey, we, we do have a policy that states it has to be sent in advance so we can screen them one, so we can, people can review them. Uh, and we've had instances, just so you know, in the past where someone has presented and has taken uh, 15, 20 minutes and the data that they showed was incorrect. And so it became kind of a messy situation. So we'd like to get the slides at least, you know, 48 hours in advance so we can circulate them and then perhaps allow them to be shown. I mean, there's no guarantee that they will be, but you made your point in an excellent way in five minutes. So it's, it's, you don't need your slides. I, I thought the, the screenshots, particularly from Energy Star and Consumer Reports were sort of interesting. Sure, I understand. And we can't, I mean, I remember I, I, w I happened to have the good fortune of uh, being the commissioner delegate at the select board meeting. I recall people in a setting like this it's very difficult in these Zoom meetings, right? I mean, we're all sitting here like the Brady Bunch. Um, and, you know, it's hard to, like, communicate. But some people were ask, asking, hey, can I put up a couple slides to illustrate what they were saying? And it was very effective. And I think it was just happening organically as opposed to when we were in the meeting room. So, my, I mean, that was only two minutes or so. I, I would certainly like to see his slides. And maybe we could see him at the next meeting if, if that's we'll, we'll send the slides around to everyone. Okay. Are you requesting that they be shown at some point, Jeffrey, or? I'd be happy to come back and show okay. the next meeting. Well, thank Fine. you very much for taking the time to point out, and I certainly would agree with the idea. What was it again, that it should be at? 78 degrees. 78 degrees. And, and Energy Star says that, and the air conditioning manufacturers recommend 78 as a conservation, and we're suggesting during peak times when our system is stressed, we're suggesting that people raise it to 74 degrees. So that does seem like we're not, our message needs to be consistent with Energy Star, at least on peak days. No? Agreed. I certainly would be, I mean, I'd certainly be happy to, you know, is this something that we can kind of agree as a sense of the board to ask the department to do or? I, I don't see there's, there's one, there's no harm in it. And two, it uh, is based in other organizations uh, who've done the analysis. So I see absolutely no reason why we wouldn't do that unless there's, I, mean, I, I, I can literally cannot see any reason why we wouldn't uh, advise that. And either. I, I agree. I mean, I, I'd like to know why, why it was originally set up the way it was, like what the rationale was, if anybody here knows. Uh, but I, I'd agree with what's been said by Jeffrey and everybody else. Jeffrey, good catch. We'll follow up on it. All right. And thank you again to your yeah. uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. This is Jim Satterthwaite. So um, we of the, the Greater Reading Alliance for Clean Energy have, we would like to make a, a brief request regarding the clean energy policy, but that's item nine on the agenda. And with your permission, we'd like to make our comment at item nine rather than holding up the meeting and, and talking out of context about that issue right now. Okay, that's, that's absolutely fine. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anyone else, please? If not, yes. let's, um, let's David move. Kay. Oh, David, okay, yes, please. From the Unitarian Church in Reading. Um, pardon the naivete of this question, but um, maybe you could just point me in the general direction for how we would go about adding solar energy devices to our church in the future. Um, don't need don't need a don't need an encyclopedia of information right now. Just uh, just point me in the right down the right path, and uh, that will that would answer my, our question for us. Thank you, Colleen. Would you uh, have any um, immediate comment to Mr. K's question? No. Yeah, we will we will provide that information to you uh, before our next meeting. Great. Thank you. Um, can can I add that Chuck is sitting here, Chuck? 
do you want to speak on uh, solar uh, opportunity for the church? The uh, church can find uh, information on our uh, rebate opportunities uh, online. Um, the issue for the church as a nonprofit will be taking advantage of uh, incentives that are provided through uh, tax offsets. And since uh, the church doesn't pay taxes, uh, it can't take advantage of the tax offset benefits. But if you would like to contact uh, RMLD's Integrated Resources Department, uh, we would be glad to uh, discuss in more detail uh, how the church can uh, work through that uh, aspect of the process and what are available uh, for incentives and what the filing process would look like, uh, depending on the scale of the church's project. Thank you, Chuck. Any uh, other comments? If I might, as long as I am unmuted, um, we did uh, already uh, address uh, the issue of uh, setting temperature. We have moved the specific values out of the way and have recommended increasing a couple of degrees um, rather than try to pinpoint specific targets uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, we did uh, note the catch in the Reading Chronicle, and that was because they copied uh, an older version of the notification. We're working with them to uh, – I don't know if I went uh, down or not. Uh, we're working with them to um, use updated copy, and uh, we're aware of the video. And uh, we are uh, re-recording that piece of it with the specific temperature ranges in it. So we have moved to a non-specific recommendation to increase uh, three or four degrees uh, temperature. And the reason for that is that uh, we're not sure how off-putting it would be for people to find that the specific temperature setting uh, that is recommended for them to start at is above where uh, their temperature setting uh, actually is. So uh, please. Thank you, Jack. I, I, think, um, I think we can discuss this uh, offline yep. uh, more further and uh, because I think both of those are good points, but um, you know, if we have independent organizations recommending uh, certain areas, we, well, I, I, I just suggest we, we discuss it offline. If that's okay. We'd be glad to. Thank you. Uh, could we move on to item number seven, uh, general manager's report? Um, Ms. O'Brien, the RMLD COVID-19 response. Yes, thanks. Uh, so um, I've been keeping the board and all the uh, employees up to date on our EOP emergency operating procedure uh, on COVID infectious disease. Uh, we are uh, currently and have been um, ahead of, of the safety issues on this. Uh, we've had team meetings every day, 10 o'clock, since uh, the 1st of March. Um, we, there are four areas of the governor's order, which uh, was recently sent out. We've sent out two memos on that. That's staffing, hygiene, um, cleaning, and um, operating. And we are well within the 10 people per 1,000 square foot of accessible space. We have increased all of our cubicles up to the six foot level with uh, plexiglass. Any of the cubicles that were open-ended, including our customer service, has been added with plexiglass. Uh, our teams A and B on operations still remain on site, but at different locations. We still have most of the uh, uh, administrative staff working remotely. Our business and electrical continuity, even through several storms, has been spot on. Uh, no one has gotten ill, so that's uh, very good. And uh, we continue to, uh, you know, work with the town and the command incident uh, team. We have not heard back from the Board of Health as far as opening our building, but since most of the customers have found paying online, uh, we really haven't had much pressure to open. But when we do, 
uh, through the Board of Health, uh, our lobby is all marked about wearing a face mask, keeping uh, social distancing, and we're ready for the public uh, when we do get opened. Um, thank you. Any, uh, any discussion or comments? If, if not, uh, perhaps we can move uh, to you, Chuck, again, for the integrated resources. Okay. Um, I do have a slide presentation. If Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> a very detailed one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, despite the detail, we will try and push through it rather quickly. Um, so this is a, uh, a new slide. Um, we have been tracking uh, the loads against uh, the budget for 2020. And uh, as I stated previously, the first three months of the year, uh, our actuals were running below uh, our loads. This was pre-COVID-19 impacts. Uh, beginning uh, in April and including May, uh, we were again running low, but so it factored in there uh, along with weather uh, and some other things were the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, we got to June and uh, lo and behold, uh, our actual load was higher than our forecasted load. So the the conclusion that we're drawing from this is that uh, we were not as adversely impacted by COVID-19 uh, as uh, we had uh, initially projected. And as we go through uh, the summer months uh, and into the fall, uh, we're going to continue to monitor the load situation. But uh, we're, we're hopeful that uh, we are not going to see uh, a significant uh, decline uh, in economic activity due to uh, COVID-19, especially due to the fact that uh, the Commonwealth is now coming out of that. So I uh, wanted to put that up there just as, a, as an indication of uh, where things uh, are going at this point. So, Chuck, uh, can I interrupt for one second? Um, Dave Hennessy, I was just wondering why we think that's the case, that it hasn't impacted us economically. It has uh, impacted us severely economically. Uh, we have not seen the loads uh, for uh, our system drop off uh, dramatically. Um, if you recall back in March when we first uh, presented <coughs> estimates, uh, we were looking at uh, the same range of impact that others were nationally in the 6 to 8% range. Uh, that did not happen, uh, and as we come back out, we believe that we're seeing a restoration of much of that. Our commercial sector did not close down. Uh, we uh, did not experience uh, losses in retail sales, uh, and uh, the payment history uh, is looking very good. Uh, people still taking advantage of the prompt payment discount uh, at levels equal to what they were before the uh, COVID-19 impacts. So um, the anecdotal evidence uh, that's in right now says that uh, we're in good shape. Uh, we've come out of this. Uh, our revenue stream is strong. Our loads remain strong. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, next, please, Tracy. So overall, uh, we're tracking our uh, purchase power expense uh, against the budget. Um, you can see that uh, we've uh, come in well below uh, expected uh, projections. Um, and right now, we see nothing that would uh, dissuade us from uh, continued uh, lower than anticipated power supply expenses. We're actually seeing hours of the day, even during the summer, when the uh, cost per kilowatt hour in the wholesale market 
is uh, two to two and a half cents. Normally in the summertime, we're looking at uh, something closer to five cents uh, for the energy that we purchase. So um, we're, we're seeing a rather dramatic decrease in that uh, market value uh, of power. So uh, there is still a significant downward pressure on rates. Uh, Tracy, the next slide, please. Um, so these are our energy costs. Uh, much of ours is under contract, but you can see that uh, we're not seeing uh, upward pressure on the market portion of our portfolio. And uh, our costs uh, are holding uh, slightly below uh, what was budgeted. Uh, next slide, please. Capacity costs uh, are usually uh, fixed, and um, they have been running slightly below uh, where they were projected to be. Uh, this is uh, one of the bigger contributors to uh, our uh, power supply uh, market savings. And I can't tell if I'm live because my screen just went blank. Oh. But I'm still hearing things. So uh, okay. if we go to the, the next slide, um, I'll see if I can talk blind here. Uh, this should be our transmission expense. And uh, looking at the uh, transmission expense, uh, we uh, see that that's uh, down below uh, where it was projected. The uh, reason for that is that um, we have had our uh, loads uh, at peak down rather significantly. And as a result of that, um, we've uh, brought transmission expense in uh, lower than expected. Um, I apologize. I'm still flying blind, so I'm not sure what the next slide you got the PowerPoint presentation, though, in front of you, right, Chuck? I mean, no, I can't see my screen. That's my screen's gone oh. blank. Oh, <laughs> so let me see. So, this is actual kilowatt purchases by resources. Okay. Um, again, uh, basically, that's showing uh, where our resource portfolio is coming from. Uh, That is Chuck, if you want to take a minute and just uh, reboot your machine, uh, go ahead. Okay, there we go. All right, so you can you can see where our uh, resource mix is coming from. Uh, basically, uh, we have uh, been selling back to the market uh, small quantities each month, uh, but the rest of our portfolio has operated uh, uh, as anticipated. So the, uh, the units are producing. Uh, we've had no unexpected uh, outages uh, uh, impacting us. So uh, next slide, please. Okay. This is um, a projected uh, portfolio uh, that includes uh, all of the uh, non-carbon resources that we have under contract, whether they are uh, solar, wind, hydro, uh, or nuclear. Uh, we have put them on the chart here. What this shows uh, if you look at the uh, dotted red line, that is the uh, Commonwealth's original renewable portfolio standard. Uh, that was replaced uh, fairly recently with the clean energy standard uh, that looks to non-carbon uh, generation, uh, but sets a higher uh, goal standard. Uh, for the investor-owned utilities. The yellow line is what the municipal light plants uh, proposed about a year ago uh, in the legislature. Uh, it is called the Golden Bill, and 
it is uh, the standard that uh, we are recommending the municipal light plants in Massachusetts uh, be held to. Uh, you can see from the portfolio resources that in the early years, uh, we are ahead of the curve uh, in terms of our potential to meet uh, any of the uh, standard lines that uh, are there. And uh, in another uh, four years, uh, we're looking at something like 70% of our portfolio uh, being uh, non-carbon. Uh, as the contracts, 10-year uh, contracts, uh, begin to wear off, uh, that drops, but we have the opportunity to renew those or expand into uh, other contracts. So we've, uh, we've made pretty aggressive efforts at uh, a non-carbon portfolio uh, going forward. So um, Tracy, the next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that we were asked to uh, produce was a valuation study for uh, the RECs that uh, we have in our portfolio. Uh, our RECs basically fall into uh, three categories, uh, class one RECs, class two RECs, and a category called other. Uh, those happen to be a couple of projects in Vermont and Maine uh, that don't meet the Connecticut and Massachusetts uh, RECs thresholds. But if we take a look, the, the class one RECs uh, are currently valued at about four and a half cents a kilowatt hour, and the class two RECs uh, are currently valued at about two cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, so when we take a look at uh, the impacts of uh, selling or retiring the RECs, uh, we used uh, two cents a kilowatt hour uh, for those RECs in our portfolio value is class two and uh, four cents a kilowatt hour uh, in our portfolio for those recs valued as class one. So those values, uh, we've been able to go through and uh, determine uh, impacts uh, from uh, different configurations of uh, treatment for the recs. Uh, Tracy, the next slide, please. So uh, the, this is uh, the listing uh, of the uh, RECs that we have, uh, or at least have control of uh, in our portfolio. Um, uh, class one, class two are fairly straightforward. The Palmer option uh, are RECs that we have the right of first refusal for. We don't pay for them currently, uh, but if uh, when the plant starts producing, uh, we want to uh, acquire and retire the RECs associated with uh, that output, uh, we have the uh, capability to do so. Uh, the other RECs uh, are worth maybe a dollar a megawatt hour. Uh, the effects are the non-carbon generation associated with um, the nuclear uh, contribution in our portfolio. Um, we have been participating in the DOER uh, program uh, for installing uh, solar on our uh, distribution system, and I have a report on how that's uh, performing. Uh, those are currently in at uh, zero until we get an assessment of uh, how much uh, that uh, project activity is going to produce for us. Uh, but those are by year, uh, the total uh, non-carbon uh, components of our uh, portfolio uh, that we can use to um, meet uh, the different standards depending on what the legislature eventually decides should apply to municipal light plants. So the next uh, slide, please, Tracy. So, I've uh, put in here some definitions uh, just to refresh everybody. Uh, those can be read uh, uh, at people's leisure. Uh, the next, please. 
So what I went through and did was determined um, for the uh, golden bill, the uh, clean energy standards, the renewable portfolio standards, um, what the uh, impacts on retail rates would be with complying with each of those standards. And then in addition, uh, I took a look at what the impact would be if uh, we were to uh, acquire and retire uh, all of the RECs in our portfolio. And I added one more step and said we would uh, acquire and uh, retire the Rex option in the Palmer biomass uh, project that we have. So over time, those uh, are what we would expect to see as rate impacts uh, from each of those. Uh, next slide, please, Tracy. This is simply a graphic representation of the data that's on the previous page. Uh, the yellow is the rate impact uh, by year of uh, retiring uh, the RECs to meet uh, the Golden Bill uh, standard. Uh, the uh, clean energy standard compliance is the uh, peach colored. The renewable portfolio standard, um, which is the um, renewables standard. Uh, we have the um, retiring all of the RECs uh, that we currently control from our projects. Uh, and then the uh, blue is the RECs and the biomass. So simply a gra graphical uh, representation of the rate impacts uh, each year for retiring the RECs in those years. Uh, next, please. Now, uh, we uh, signed up for uh, matching uh, rebate contributions for a DOER grant program that uh, was supposed to run uh, through June of this year. Uh, we originally uh, committed to $250,000 of matching funds uh, for DOER. Uh, to date, uh, we have uh, made rebate uh, commitments of uh, just under 165,000. We have uncommitted funds of 85,000 between now and uh, the end of the year uh, for projects to take advantage of. We're at about 66% uh, spent to date of the uh, grant entitlement. Uh, we have 28 uh, participants. And with an average payout of uh, 5,875 per participant, we estimate that there are another uh, 15 project slots uh, based on the current uh, allocation to RMLD of DOER grant funds. So we think um, we've uh, made some pretty good headway uh, with that project. Uh, next slide, please. So we have uh, a couple of uh, programs that we actually uh, launched recently. Uh, I apologize. The, to get the information on the slide, I had to compress it a little bit. Um, but we've been running um, a yard equipment, cordless yard equipment uh, program. Uh, we have... Uh, an electric panel upgrade program for people who are uh, acquiring electric vehicles and need a little more capacity on their panel, or those who are putting in uh, heat pump uh, technology uh, and need a little more room on their panels. So um, we've got uh, so far 85 rebates paid out uh, for the cordless electric yard equipment. Uh, we've done two panel upgrades, and uh, we have six uh, air source uh, heat pumps that we have paid out. Uh, that is through June 30th. Uh, the updated numbers have uh, grown a little bit uh, from there. But uh, 
for the cordless electric yard equipment, we've actually uh, had to increase the uh, budget allocation uh, because it was more uh, successful than uh, we had originally anticipated. Um, so that's what I had for my presentation this evening. Okay, thank you very much, Chuck. Do we have any uh, comments uh, from? from I, have, I, have a, I have a question, Chuck. Your usual excellent, uh, detailed uh, presentation here. Thank you and Colleen for this work. I greatly appreciate it. As you know, I've been uh, I, I sent a couple emails over the last couple of weeks asking questions, and you've already answered them. I'm very grateful for that. I, I wondered if you could go back to the um, slide where you showed what the percentage increases would be under these different regimes. That one, yeah. So um, this is right here. It's like, thank you. So what I'm seeing here is that to, to comply with the clean energy standard, the rates would have to go up. You're estimating 2.96% next year and 1.58% more than they otherwise would, right? Is that the gist of that? Yes. Follow me and so on. So, you know, there surely will be differences of opinion on the board and among the public about whether to make, whether to consider that. But I do think this is something that the that we should be looking at and we should have the option and we should be offering out to the people who elect us and who are our rate payers to say, hey, are you willing to, my, you know, my, my electric bill is about $70, $80. So 2.9% 2, 2 would, be, would be a couple of dollars a month, uh, you know, less than a cup of a latte, right, a month. I'm certainly willing to pay that and, and John Stenbeck mentioned the last meeting, hey, could we adopt a rate payer for people who, who are having trouble? I certainly would be willing to do that for a neighbor. So I just hope that as we go forward and look at our, our policy number 30, we, we consider this as an option and we decide as a board, which of these do we want to go? Do we want to have the minimum or do we want to go and meet the synergy standard like the IOUs do, if I understand that correctly, and have our rates go up 2 or 3% more, put that out there, and, and have that conversation. And that's kind of all I wanted to get across. So you saved, uh, saved me a lot of time later, so I really thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. And uh, this will definitely be a topic of conversation for us yep. over the next few months. And um, there's so many different considerations we have to take care of, obviously, in terms of people who can pay or willing to pay, and then those who are obviously are uh, out of a job and any little bit hurts them somewhat. So we need to be uh, clever and uh, flexible about helping them to do this as well. So yep. uh, we'll certainly discuss this uh, moving forward. And Chuck, I agree, uh, excellent presentation, thank you. Um, can we move on to the next, uh, if there are no other comments, on to uh, item number nine. And uh, Mr. Talbot, uh, Dave, I think that's your, uh, yep. your topic you had Set before I, yeah, I went to the select board. Uh, the The main topic of that item was that it was it fell to me. I was very happy to do it to uh, represent us before the select board on Tuesday evening. It was a great conversation at a high level. The select board is interested in you know what can we do as a town and how the town and the RMLD can work together on various initiatives having to do with whether it's clean energy or anything else and. Um, and the select board, as many of you may know, has been interested in the Green Communities Program, um, which is a great program. And, you know, ha fitting that into our context is challenging because we serve, you know, four towns. So having that's one of the challenges. So having one of the four very anxious to do this um, is great. How do we move forward? And I know that Colleen and, and Chuck are working on that to get those technical answers and including whether there's a a way to do a mirror version of that program. Uh, it's a little above my head in terms of the technical and policy details, which is why it's great to have, you know, the smart people in the room uh, being Chuck and Colleen. Um, one thing I, and I'll, I'd like to actually ask them to just briefly touch on that before I do. Um, I also mentioned to the select board who was asking, um, you know, you know, what can we collaborate on? And I, I pointed out about the peak warnings, you know, does the town government itself act on those warnings when it receives them? And it appeared that there is not a, a protocol in effect uh, at the town level and that that might be something that the town looks at doing, which would be great. 
you know, as we've seen, some of these peaker plants uh, saw a slide, I think Chuck presented it somewhere, where the peak oil plant at Stony Point, you know, is 10 times as much uh, wholesale cost as other power plants. So it's both a very dirty power plant and a very expensive one. So whether your main concern is uh, emissions or money, uh, there's something for uh, all of you in wanting to not use that plant as much or at all. So hopefully the town will, will act on that. I'd like to, you know, if Colleen and Chuck want to, um, to say anything about green communities, if not, it's fine, but just know that it's a, it's a topic that came up. Um, uh, Jim uh, Satterthwaite, I think you had, you wanted to come in and with a public comment at this point? Yes, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to let us do it at this time. And I wanna thank uh, Colleen and the RMD staff for revisiting the sustainable energy policy at this time and to Chuck for anticipating these concerns by putting so much good information in the presentation we just saw. Um, so I, I, I'm going to read what I have in the interest of um, brevity and uh, precision, but it is, it's not long. It's just, just over a page and it will take well under the five minutes probably. <laughs> okay, <laughs> timer started. <laughs> as long as you don't have any slides, right? Big timer's going. <laughs> Okay, well, as my name is Jim Sanathway, I live on Hunt Street, and I'm a member of the um, Greater Reading Alliance for Clean Energy, or GRACE. Um, thanks again for letting us talk now. Um, the reference point for my comment is item 3D on the draft sustainable energy policy, which appeared on the board book. Um, and it said that the RMLD would adapt to the clean energy standard and the renewable portfolio standard, if required by the state legislature to do so. Um, now, as the board and the RMLD staff know, um, but some of the other listeners may not, the CES and the RPS are standards that Massachusetts enforces on the investor-owned utilities, or IOUs, um, which supply electricity to about 85% of the state. And um, when you hear people talk about IOUs in this context, just think of Eversource and National Grid. That's basically who we're talking about at this end of the state. Um, the Clean Energy Standard and the Renewable Portfolio Standard uh, are not currently binding on municipal light plants, such as the RMLD, but they constitute the only well-defined set of agreed upon rules against we can measure ourselves to see if we are doing our fair share to mitigate climate change. Um, now, Mr. Underhill's uh, or Chuck's uh, current and past presentations show that the RMLD has prepared for the contingency that the RPS and the CES might in the near future become binding upon the RMLD. There are several bills working their way through the legislature and we don't know which ones will be passed. Um, but in this context, our request is a simple one. Um, catching up with the rest of the state in terms of clean energy is the right thing to do. And we've made preparations for it. So let's do it without, and not worry about whether the legislature is making us do it or not. And so I'll put the following single sentence in, in air quotes um, because it constitutes the full request of our organization tonight. Quote, um, Grace requests that the RMLD adopt a policy of parity um, with the investor-owned utilities, hitting the same annual targets for renewable and clean energy and reporting progress under exactly the same rules. Um, and we're ad advocating this policy for the following reasons. There are four points, but they're all short. Um, so point one is, it's not only simple, but comprehensive. Um, the policy phrased this way, it immediately defines what types of energy are counted and what types are not counted. It automatically prohibits the double counting of renewable energy certificates, which has been a controversial topic. Um, it spells out incremental improvement from year to year. And it even entails that the RMLD will hit new targets if such targets are mandated for the rest of the state. So it basically just helps us, you know, be pulling with the same weight on our OR as what everybody else in the other 85% of the state is doing on their ORs. Um, number two, as reasonable people, we don't think we can really ask for more. Um, cost is always a factor and the RMLD has multiple constituencies to please. Uh, but number three, and perhaps most important, um, as people of conscience and our group was founded when two churches in town got together, we don't see how we can ask for less. Um, the rules imposed on the IOUs are the only transparent standard against which we can measure the fairness of our burden sharing relative to the rest of the state. The four towns served by the RMLD are relatively affluent with median annual family incomes between $114,000 and $125,000. 
The correspond mining number for neighboring Woburn is 83,000. For the state as a whole, it's 80,000. And for Lynn, which borders on Linfield, it's only 54,000, or less than half the number for any of our four towns. So I think we should have moral clarity about this. It is not fair or just that our less affluent neighbors should pull their weight in creating a cleaner energy supply while we do less. Yes, municipal light plants have a different business model than investor-owned utilities, but there's a simple bottom line at the customer level as far as you know, how much we individually are paying and, and how much pollution we're creating for what we're paying. And um, if we at the customer level, if we're taking advantage of a legislative loophole in order to pay less by polluting more, then we, and I'm talking about us, the customer base, who ultimately guide our MLD policy, we've become, well, we become those people who put money in their pockets by exploiting loopholes in order to pollute. And um, that's not who we want to be. So uh, that, that's, our, that, that's our main point. Thank you, Jim. That was, uh, that was well done. Although we're, we're not the people who put money in our pocket. We put the money back in your pocket. <laughs> no, I, I'm, Sam, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about us as the customers because I know. you as a customer in the false position because I'm basically paying less in order to pollute. And I want to pay the right amount. And I'm sure the RMLD can bring this in a lot cheaper than Eversource and IOU are. But I would, you know, it's not going to cost a lot more. But let's just be fair and do our equal share. The last thing I wanted to say was that um, a far-sighted policy adopted now by the RMLD may have influence beyond the borders of our four towns um, as the largest of the municipal light plants and the only one serving four different towns. The RMLD is, a, is a position to be a leader and to set an example that the smaller municipal light plants can point to and follow. So um, that concludes my remarks and, and thank you very much for considering our request. Thanks. Thank you. Um, excellent comments. Um, uh, any discussion from members of the board? I think well, I might say that you know we're on we're on that road. I mean, we are trying to do that. Uh, I think all of us on the on the board are looking for um, all the items that you've just discussed. And the issue that we have, as you well know, is it is one of cost at the present time. I mean, if we could find you know uh, energy uh, that was less expensive, we could still accomplish that. We'd still be ahead of the IOUs because the IOUs, if their average rate is twenty five percent higher at least than what we're paying uh, in any of our towns. Uh, so for you saw from Chuck's data is if we implemented all the elements, biomass plus um, RECs, uh, et cetera, the bill average bill retail bill would increase by 10%. Uh, so at the retail level for many of us who are, have jobs and are doing fine, I agree with you, it's probably not very much of an issue and we're doing the right thing. Uh, the flip side is for those people who are on fixed income or who don't have a job, it is not so easy to to uh, um, swallow. And that's why we're trying to consider other programs or other things we might be able to do to you know, have this writer thing that Dave talked about with one person paying for the second or uh, perhaps some, some other funding source that we might be able to find to help alleviate that for some period of time. Uh, so we don't disagree with you. Um, in, in general, we really don't. Uh, we just we want to know what all the rules are and what our boundaries are, so that we can do the right thing. And at the end of the day, you know, our charter is to provide reliable uh, power to everyone in our four towns at the lowest possible cost. Uh, and you know, obviously, we're wrapping that into our policy of of clean energy and renewable energy as well. So, but thank you for the comments. We we take them to heart. John, can I make a comment? Yes, please go right ahead. Okay, um, just uh, just a little information about what we're doing right now. I mean, the money that we sell in Rex uh, gets reinvested uh, in the projects. When when Chuck showed you that chart and you saw the the white dotted area at the part at the top, that's really our open position. And we are very careful when we're buying uh, projects that are low risk, and we do try to be concerned with meeting. Uh, you know, the commitments that we have without adversely impacting the customers. But I'm going to ask Chuck to just explain a little bit. I mean, we're, we're, we are committing to serving the electricity that feeds our electric vehicle infrastructure that's, you know, we've started and that's going to be taking off, uh, with clean energy. Uh, we do a lot with that money that we sell the RECs and 
from the last several conferences that I've gone to, you know, area ones with peers, uh, the municipal light plants are one of the largest organizations that makes the investment into new green or clean initiatives of projects in this particular area. Like, for example, that biomass project that you saw, that was the municipals getting together to make that happen. So we're making a lot happen, and that's what we're doing with that with that extra money. So I just want to throw that out there because whatever the board decides on, uh, once they're well informed, we need to take that into consideration too. Because we need projects in this area all throughout New England in order to, um, you know, to make this work. Because otherwise, you're you're buying wrecks on paper and doing things like that. And we want we want to be part of building those things. We want to, we want them here. So. I'll I'll ask Chuck to to add another comment if that's okay with you, John. Sure, go ahead. Okay, thank you. As Colleen pointed out, um, we have a philosophy that um, we instituted at the same time that we began our electrification programs. That is the uh, acceleration of penetration of electric vehicles. Uh, into the transportation uh, sector and the uh, deployment of heat pump technology uh, into the building envelope sector. And as part of that, uh, we made a commitment to the commission when we presented these programs that we would acquire sufficient resources uh, from non-carbon production that we would not be uh, deploying electric vehicle technology and fueling the batteries in the electric vehicles with carbon uh, derivative uh, energy production. So uh, we, as you saw on the portfolio, we've been very aggressive about uh, the acquisition of non-carbon technology. Now, uh, that uh, is something that we're able to do and still maintain the electric rates where they have been. You heard from the auditor uh, that 2019 uh, we achieved a significant uh, energy cost reduction over 2018. Uh, 2020 we're, we're holding that course. Uh, so we, we think we've struck a pretty good balance in terms of being able to uh, meet uh, the interests and the needs of uh, all of the community. But um, right now our uh, programs are providing us uh, that resource, the question will be uh, a policy one for the Commission to address. Uh, if we uh, elect to uh, move to retire uh, RECs, uh, do they want to uh, vote supplemental funds for us to continue the aggressive pursuit of new resources, uh, or do we slow that uh, in order to strike a balance with, with the rate technology. So uh, my job is to implement the policies that the Commission uh, develops. That's what we will do. Uh, I just point out that there are some additional facets uh, to the activities and that uh, my team has worked very hard to strike a balance uh, on the uh, facets that uh, we're deploying. The, uh, I might just add a, one, another little side note to that, and that's that, you know, we have a disproportionate customer on the industrial side in analog devices, which is about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 60% of our load, something like that. They're um, about 12% of the load. Sorry? They're about 12%. 12%. Of our but they're, they're still larger than any other. Yeah, our, our commercial industrial sector is about 60% of our load. Right. Thank you. So we, we are highly dependent on business activity. And what we're trying to do from an economic development perspective is by keeping electric rates low to attract new businesses into the area, and especially with people who are high electric users, such as analog, for example. And we're very concerned about that because if you look at them from a strategic perspective, uh, they've acquired linear technology, which is based in Washington State, where the cost per kilowatt hour is a fraction of ours, uh, so that they could easily move there if they chose to. Uh, they just also bought another large semiconductor manufacturer, not in this area. So we're doing all that we can to reserve these large customers who are large electric users as well. And, that, and that's, that's just part of why we're trying to keep the rates low uh, as, as well. 
Now, the, the flip side of that is one of the reasons they're here is because of the uh, engineering resources that are in this area, right? Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, all the colleges, et cetera, which contribute probably even more than just the basic cost of electricity. But it's yet one more element to convince them to stay here. So we're wrestling with these these types of things day in and day out. And it's not just all about being carbon free. It's all about who our customers are as well and how do we, we meet all those needs in a kind of a mixed bag, a weighted uh, average. Make sense? May I make one brief clarifying comment and then I'll be quiet for the rest of the evening, I promise? <laughs> yeah, the rest of the evening's going quickly. <laughs> All right, so um, in, the, in the very short term, our request may be more about reporting than about any concrete action. So I've been attending these meetings for six months now and I really enjoy Chuck's presentations, but I still can't tell from the, the data we're seeing how well we're doing according to the rules that the IOUs follow. So the, there's a big game in town, that's the IOU game. Those are a set of rules that everybody follows. And I appreciate all the activities that you're doing, what the three of you have just said, but that come, what that amounts to is you're saying, well, forget about that game, we're doing something different over here, but there's no way I, one can compare the two. And one suspects that in paying lower rates than in, much lower rates than in Woburn, and not having any data on how we're doing, that maybe we're, we're polluting a good bit more than uh, our neighbors in Uber. And so would it be possible, Chuck, for you every month to present a plot that shows if we followed the rules of the IOU, including selling of racks and so forth, where we are, and then and then we could track it. And then if we are lower, then, you know, then, then it's okay to make footnotes and give reasons like, okay, we didn't meet this, but these are the other things we did. But at the moment, we're completely blind as to how we're doing relative to the other towns. Sure. So just that information. Sorry, can I, ask, can yes. I ask a question? Sure. Um, isn't that exactly the slide that we've been showing that shows where we are and exactly how we're doing relative to RPSC, CES, and the Golden Bill? That's exactly what that's exactly what I asked Chuck to develop almost you know six or eight months ago, and that's how we're tracking exactly what your question is. I, am I missing that? But some of those wrecks are being sold. So in that plot, then there should be another bar that you know these are things that were contracted for um, for clean energy, but then we sold the wrecks. So then there's kind of another bar there that takes away from the others that says this is the energy that um, uh, that's getting burned in the system statewide because we sold the wrecks. We, and we don't know what energy that is. But if we sell the wrecks, then we, we can't say it's clean energy anymore, right? And, and I think, Chuck, what you're showing is the contracts and not the contracts after the selling of wrecks. Is that correct? The contracts um, entitle us to the wrecks. I could come into a commission meeting uh, at the end of the quarter and hold up a sheaf of paper and say, these are the wrecks. We own them. Therefore, the last quarter, those were green. Uh, that's an honest report to the commission. And then the next day, I sell the racks. Um, what we are showing is the potential for green based on the uh, entitlements to racks that we have. We do not have to retire those racks at this point. So we sell them. Uh, and we use the proceeds uh, to put back into uh, acquiring other projects, upfront investment in other projects. Now, you're right. We don't get the green label on those, but that is something that is instantaneously transformative. Uh, the day after the uh, commission makes uh, a change to any of the policies, uh, I am able to implement that change by changing our uh, transactions in the wholesale market to accommodate uh, the policies uh, that the commission has uh, set forth. So um, I'm not exactly sure how to address uh, the issue that you raise. As Colleen pointed out, uh, the municipals are the ones that are actually putting up the um, security for a lot of these projects, wind projects by Patriot Renewables up in Maine, uh, gravity uh, renewables, primarily hydro uh, in Connecticut and Massachusetts. All of those developers come to municipal light plants and have us secure the output. That's 80% of the project. And 
by us signing up for that on 10 year uh, increments that gives the wherewithal for those projects to move forward. So I'm, I'm not trying to get into a semantics game about what something is on day one, day two, or day three, uh, depending on uh, what kinds of uh, transactions uh, have occurred for uh, defined pieces of it. But uh, the short answer is, uh, and that's the, the chart of rates uh, or rate impacts that I put up, we can today comply with any of those standards and our resource portfolio will keep us in compliance into 2032 or 2033, depending on which of the uh, standards that you're looking at. So we have that capability. We can do it. Uh, it's a definitional issue uh, going forward rather than an engineering uh, issue for us. Okay, great. I think we've, we've, we've reached the uh, end of this discussion period. Thank you very much, uh, Jim and everyone else, uh, for your input. Uh, excellent discussion. Um, and let's see, I think we're to the end of the meeting, if, uh, if that's okay. We're, the uh, next is, uh, item is really our next RMLD board meeting. I see it's listed here as Thursday, August 20th. Does that uh, meet with everyone's uh, acceptance? Yep. That's fine. John, I actually did have a question on that last. We've only had an hour and 15 minute meeting here. May, may I have one minute just to follow up on that? I'm, I got the egg timer set on you, Dave, right you now. Set that egg timer and then throw the egg in my head. Um, if it's possible, and I think I have to admit I didn't understand everything Chuck just said. I know everybody else did, but I, I didn't quite follow every piece of it. Um, is it. Does the question make sense to say, if you looked at RMLD right now under the IOU rules, this is where we would be. Is that a question that makes sense and can be answered? Yeah, that's my first quick yes or no. Is that, can that question be answered? Yes. Okay. And it's not in the slides now, or it could be for an, the subsequent meeting? It is in the slide package. It's probably okay. about slide six or seven. It's okay. the one with the blue and green uh, colors for the uh, resources, and it has the three uh, project lines. Okay, thank you. And then my other one was something that I did mean to mention, which is something I think we all can agree on, which is that these peakers, they cost a fortune. They, they're dirty also. We use them very little now, but could we get to a point where we don't have to use them at all? It's a great credit to the department that we have a five megawatt battery, but I know we still use those peakers. They cost way more than what we sell the electricity for. So we lose money and they're very dirty. So can we maybe can, as part of our goal setting, can we, can we get away from them entirely? And um, well, first of all, what I'd like to suggest is we answer whether that's true or not. I mean, whether that question is true or not, Dave, and if it is, then, uh, yeah. Okay. You know, okay, we, if yeah. I'm wrong that we don't use them, then, then please correct me. If we don't use them, then correct me. I think no, that's an ISO. Go okay. ahead. Rob, go ahead. No, oh, isn't that an ISO New England question? That's not, that's, that, that's, pow that's power supply in the background. That's not power supply in the distribution side. So I think when you, when you talk about using a peaker, it's, it's based on the load, based on ISO. It's got nothing to do with Reading, okay. reading light per se. So you can't determine whether or not that plant goes off, okay. off or on. There's, there's, there's contracts made up by ISO that determine okay. when that plant kicks on a, a, as a backup. So we don't have any say whether that plant turns off or on. And by the way, everybody, uh, uh, Robert Coulter is uh, what, an actual engineer on the call and knows the business. Yes. But I thought we had a contract with Stony Point that was a separate, separate from the ISO. We have a contract to buy p p power from the oil peaker at, at Stony Point. We are uh, owners of Stony Brook through Amwec. Yep. We actually own, that's one of the few resources we actually own. Okay. Now, the, the answer to your question, uh, you asked me per megawatt hour, what does the unit cost each year? Yeah. One of the things that drives the cost per megawatt hour up is how little it is dispatched. Mm -hmm. The less we use it, the more per megawatt hour. But, that unit 
has an offset value to the capacity costs that we pay. So we do get value. We do use it. We pay $2.50 to $3 a KW month for that unit. That's what it costs us, the fixed cost. But we are able to offset $5 a KW month capacity costs that ISO would charge us if we didn't have the unit. So that unit is actually producing a cost savings to us. The unit is dispatching less and less because loads are down in New England. There is more renewable that's pushing on the bottom of the curve and pushing the resources up. So the dirtier and older plants um, are being pushed out. Um, Mystic 8 and 9 are actually due to retire. Uh, they're older than the uh, Stony Brook units. So uh, I'm not trying to teach Power Supply 101 here tonight, but there are other uh, pieces to that that an offline discussion uh, might help uh, better uh, let's, shape. Let's up. do that. We're, yep. we're now entering the matrix. Let's, uh, let's go offline. <laughs> Thanks for tolerating the extra discussion, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Dave. You ask, ask excellent questions. Um, the uh, next CAB meeting, uh, Representative Mr. Pacino, I believe for August. Yeah, I'm on. And for September, Mr. Hennessy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So um, I'd like to move that we uh, yeah. move into executive session. Okay. Move that the board go into executive session to consider the purchase of real property and to discuss deployment of security personnel or devices or strategy with respect thereto and return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Second. Thank you. Um, we uh, have a vote, please. Mr. Stenbeck, aye. Mr. Yes, Pacino, aye. aye. Albert, aye. Okay. Coulter, aye. Okay, we're, uh, our meeting is adjourned. We'll move into executive session. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Bye, everybody.